Welcome back to the Mandarin Blueprint podcast. We have a slightly different type of podcast for you today because we're doing an interview with somebody who certainly has no need of the Mandarin Blueprint curriculum because he's already been through the process of learning Mandarin Chinese and applying it to his life in a number of different ways. Uh, this is uh, Adam DeFrisco, who is a Chinese marketing manager and Chinese language tour guide at a Las Vegas-based tour company called Max Tour. He's also done some Chinese uh, Chinese tour guides, uh, tours in China after studying Chinese at university. And so now he's doing bilingual tours in the Southwest. Sounds like a really interesting type of uh, life that you're leading there, Adam. So let's just start off with, uh, you know, why you wanted to learn Chinese in the first place, and then we'll kind of work into how you ended up where you are now. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, so I think at the first it's actually kind of a funny story how it uh how my Chinese language learning journey started. Uh, I was in I was in university. I was at West Virginia University, and uh, I was actually studying geology at the time. Uh, but I was taking some summer classes, and to be a full time student, I needed an extra credit. So I ended up signing up for Italian. And you know, I come from an Italian family. I was always interested in it. Uh, but I showed up on the first day of class, and it was. Um, like the teacher had to be in her 80s and it was all very, I remember the stack of books was this big, it was crazy. And it was just a lot about theory and you know, very, very dry. So uh, I remember that first class ending and I was a little depressed and I was kind of like, ah, this is gonna be a rough, rough summer course. And I stayed in the room, was doing some extra homework and uh, a Chinese teacher walked in and she's like, oh, are you in this class? I said, no, I'm in the Italian class before. And she's like, oh, is there by any chance would you want to drop Italian and switch to Chinese? I have four students. I need five to make it a class. So by any chance, would you want to switch over? And, you know, she seemed young. She seemed fun. So I was like, all right, let's do it. So the next day I started learning pinyin in class. And it was such a great, you know, that five students was such a great group size uh, for a college yeah. class. So, and then it just kind of spiraled out of control. So I started, uh, you know, they, I kept taking classes. I was good at it naturally. And uh, I just wanted to keep learning. So eventually my geology grades started dropping and my Chinese grades were soaring. So that's kind of the start of the uh, long journey. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I love that. I love that the, the teacher was just like, you know, Hey, I don't have enough people. So, you know, come on over. That's yeah. pretty, it's like bold, <laughs> but it's also, you know, Hey, like why not? Especially if you had just had the experience. So uh, tell me about her uh, mm -hmm. teaching methods because you know you, you you could have had the experience like you had with the Italian teacher where you, right. you went uh, you know this is uh, dry and boring certainly a lot of people have had mm -hmm. that experience with Chinese so like what Absolutely. was it about her methods that kind of captured you I think it was more and you know we're all used to especially in America we're used to taking Spanish and French in, in high school and it's lots of the first day it's straight conjugations and just, you know, very textbook type learning. And I think what happened with Chinese is since it was so different and it was starting with pinyin, I think that the difference in the language is what got me hooked in the first place, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of the normal, you know, let's learn how to say hi first, I was learning about tones and learning about the alphabet so that was one aspect of it I think I enjoyed was just that complete difference from any romance language that I had learned. And in terms sure. of her style, she was, you know, it was very young. The other four students were, you know, very high energy, very nice. And we would just speak. And I remember that first summer, it was just, she wanted to get us saying things as fast as possible. And uh, I just remember how good of a feeling it was to be able to, um, you know, speak with my other students. And uh, there was a lot of PowerPoints and a lot of different materials. We hardly ever used a book now that I'm thinking back at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of hopping out, which is something the, that Italian teacher, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, there, I swear to God, there were six books stacked that I had to buy for this one Italian class, like beginning Italian class. So going from that to not really using one in Chinese was very, a very different style. Yeah, that seems like, oh, you know, that you're, you're giving me nightmares, like, <laughs> like <way I> know. <laughs> nightmares or memories of Chinese university. And yeah, it's just, that's yep. it's no fun to go from a book uh, in that way. So yeah, totally. Sure. I, I can, I can dig that. Well, that sounds great. I mean, you know, I love stories that start with a, 
a good teacher. And of course, you know, it sounds like the language itself was a big player, uh, which, you know, it certainly is for yeah. many people was for me. Um, so Absolutely. tell me like, so when you got into it, it sounds like at first you were just kind of uh, interested because of the sort of randomness of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she comes in and offers the Chinese course. How yeah. did your goals develop? Like, so originally, you know, you were just sort of a random chance, then it may be morphed into something else, into something else. Tell me the journey mm -hmm. of your, of your goals, not specifically, we can talk about study methods later, but like, I'm curious about what, you know, how that process goes, because I find that for many people, it doesn't stay the same. So tell me about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would agree with you when you say that. Um, at the beginning, because of how the situation started, I didn't have any goals. I honestly, I tried to drop it a couple times because I saw my geology grades dropping and I was like, you know what, I'm never, and of course, at the time, and I always kick myself for this, but I told myself constantly when I was in university that I can't have, there's no future in this. What am I going to do? You know, speaking Chinese, it might be a fun skill, but there's no, I'm not going to make a career out of it. I'm not going to do anything with it. So I kept telling myself that in university and it's something that I really wish you know, someone would have come on and told me more about it uh, when I was at that point. So at the beginning, I really didn't have any goals. I was just doing it because I was having fun and I was good at it. It felt good to be good at something naturally, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but after I did a summer abroad in Beijing, uh, that was my senior year. And I was, I had done enough courses at that time to uh, be this close to a minor in Chinese studies. Um, so, but I was a little, I was a few credits short. So the summer abroad was the only way to make up uh, for that difference. So I ended up going over to uh, Beijing, studied at a university there for two weeks, like an intensive class. Um, and I fell in love with it just absolutely. So went back to America. I started to get my master's in geology. And of course, the first thing I did when I went to grad school was look if that school had any Chinese courses. And of course they did. So I started signing up for Chinese courses there. And it got to a breaking point where I was like, you know, I can't keep, I'm not going to keep, you know, lying to myself. I'm really good at it. I'm really interested in it. So that's why I ended up moving to China. Um, and it wasn't until I actually got there that I started making goals for myself because I did realize how many job opportunities, travel opportunities uh, sprung from this. So I set my sights on another travel company that I was with before Max Tour uh, that did, they did tours all around China, like student tours around China. Uh, and I wanted to be a tour guide for them, but their level was HSK-5. That was their, you have to be HSK-5 to be a tour guide here. So that's the first time I remember having clear, like, okay, I'm going to make HSK-5 goals. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I started doing really intense, like one-on-one -on -one studies and every day after work, that type of uh, really intense studying. But yeah, I do clearly remember that was the first time I set goals for myself. So tell me about, I'm curious about, you said, you know, you went to Beijing and I mean, this doesn't surprise me because the mm -hmm. exact same thing happened to me, uh, which is that I went to sure. um, Beijing and then like, I, my perception of China changed and I went, uh, okay, so this is not what I thought it was and I like it. So that kind of got me mm -hmm. interested. And then I really, I mean, it still took me two years though, because I was in Beijing for a couple of years, right. uh, getting by on English and a, a little bit of Chinese. Uh, and then when I moved to Chengdu, mm -hmm. I liked Chengdu even more. And so then I got really got into it. But tell me about your arrival in Beijing and what made you sort of like realize, make the switch? Because it's like, obviously, once you start making more concrete goals, it's because to some degree, you can imagine your future with the skill. So it's like, what about Beijing really stuck out to you? Why did you like it so much? That's, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. It was a very large part seeing, the, seeing that I could have a future in the language. That's something that really changed. Um, and I think it started with the people. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I had grown up, uh, grown up in Italian family, speaking a little bit of Italian, speaking uh, French. I did, did French in middle school. I got the chance to go over to France and it was a horrible experience. That's for another podcast. But mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, studied Spanish in high school and I had never experienced going over somewhere and having uh, the locals be so happy that you're trying to speak their language and so accommodating in terms of, you know, helping you along with your skills and uh, kind of bringing new things to you and opening all these new doors. And I, I strongly believe that 
uh, by learning Chinese, you open up more doors than any other language at this day and age. That's really strong believer in that. Uh, so that was the, the one thing was the people and how willing they were to help, how willing they were to work with me and how excited they were that I was speaking the language. Um, so that was the first step. And I think the next thing that did it was seeing how many job opportunities and career opportunities there were in Beijing for sure. Uh, so I did end up, I actually started at a, uh, like most of us uh, teaching English. Uh, so that was the very first step, but I noticed there were schools everywhere and uh, they all had these cool deals where you could, you know, they would sign you up for Mandarin classes at night. Uh, so it was just a whole new world of opportunities. And for somebody who was going back to, uh, going back to Ohio for grad school, which didn't really sound very exciting to me. I was, you know, sitting at a desk studying data and, you know, water thing. It was just, you know, something I wasn't looking forward to. So to have that new door open and have that opportunity. And I was like, you know, at that point, I realized, you know, I'm not going to not going to be able to do this again. So might as well jump in. And it did yeah, you know, that, change, change, change my life. Yeah, yeah. The experience of uh, ex like finding out how Chinese people react to you learning the language. I think that's a huge motivator because there there's kind of a mix of one thing that is, uh, you know, true. And then one thing that maybe is a little bit prideful on uh, the part of uh, the Han culture, but you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. it's a good thing, which is that they know that their language is hard. And so they respect right. you if you try right now, some of them think our language is impossible to learn because we're like the greatest. Sure. And so obviously we've got <laughs> yep. the most complex and interesting language and you know, there's, there's that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's also, it also has the uh, element of if you put in a good effort, you put in many hours and you, uh, are trying they're never going to say like oh look at you trying you know that, what did you, you just got your tones wrong that's ridiculous like you know in other exactly. cultures they you know they either expect you to speak their language or if you do try to speak their language they're still going to be kind of uh uh look down their noses at you for not getting it perfect and so when you see how yeah. chinese people react and they're much more uh pleasant and encouraging and uh, impressed you know they're always respectful mm -hmm. it can make you feel like okay good well then that's not going to be a barrier as I continue to study that, you know, I'm going to feel embarrassed all the time. People are so nice. So it's, um, that that's a story I've heard a lot of times. So yeah. Sure. Like, and, um, so I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about how you approached getting mm -hmm. to the HSK five level. And I mean, you can also comment on, you know, the stuff you did before you set that concrete goal, but like, Sure. I'm interested in the methods you used because obviously, you know, we're very focused on method over here. And so, you know, what, Absolutely. what would you say was your, the journey of your methodology um, in mm -hmm. like broad strokes first, and then maybe we can get into some more specifics. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the, the biggest help, and especially when I was going for the HSK five, the, uh, uh, that was a little different because I did start getting back to books at that point because I needed to know, you know, what characters were on this test and, you know, the test format. So that was very much a test-based study. Um, and that was very intense for about a year and it was just solid HSK-5 materials. And, you know, they have them all out there, you know, specifically for the test. They have all these prep materials and things like that. So uh, that's mainly what I did in that last maybe six months to a year leading up to the HSK-5. Mm -hmm. um, before that, I remember right when I was just starting to kind of switch from uh, maybe, I don't know, early intermediate to late intermediate, I wouldn't call myself advanced yet at that point. But right around that transition time, I started, um, I started really broadening the different types of mediums I was learning through. So different platforms, whether it was speaking to locals or joining this club. And at that time I was in China, so I did have that advantage um, of being over there and learning the language, which accelerates it a little bit. Um, but it was a big mix of, you know, I was getting interested in reading different books, watching TV shows, and I was still at that time keeping up with my old routines that I had had from university. So flashcards, um, you know, hardcore dialogues and things like that, scripts that I was reading through. So I think that was uh, when I was kind of making that jump to being at an advanced level. 
that was something that I was doing was trying to absorb every different platform, every different medium that I could uh, to kind of get, get that kind of immersive experience. Right. Right. Did you have like sort of an approach to the different sort of layers of the language, um, you know, from pronunciation, characters, words, grammar, like, was it just, um, was it kind of like, I mean, obviously if you're following a book, I guess the book has its methodology, but like, for example, I'm always interested mm -hmm. in how people approach characters. Uh, it, you know, because that's, uh, it's a part of the language that generally in my experience, uh, you know, university curriculums and things like that don't tend to, I don't know. I, I often can't follow their logic of how they teach characters. So like any comments on that particular layer or just the layers in general? You know, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's actually something that attracted me to Mandarin Buford in the first place when I saw it and I saw how you dealt with characters. So why has nobody ever, why has nobody ever thought of that before? Because it is, it's once you get past, uh, let me think, like my elementary textbook where the characters are building on dial, like the basic introductory sentences, once you're past that level, you're right, it's characters flying at you from every direction and you have no idea how to absorb them, which ones are important, which ones you're going to use. So it is, that's, I mean, it's very accurate when you, you know, say it is very random how they come at you. And I think for me, uh, and we're talking, you know, kind of upper intermediate advanced uh, at that time, what I was doing was if I was listening to a sentence, watching a show, reading a book, uh, and I could, if I could understand a sentence, or guess at a character and still understand what was being said, then I would kind of breeze past it. But if I did come across a sentence where I was, you know, whoa, like taken aback, like, okay, no idea what that said. Then I went back and every single character picked it apart, character by character, didn't let myself get away with any easy ones and uh, really drilled and went back to the flashcards and, you know, relied heavily on a dictionary, on Pleco um, mm -hmm. and all that. So. Yeah, there was no, I, I had no real organization in terms of the sequence I was learning characters and no, that was never, never something that was available to me at the time. I'm sure it would have been very helpful. <laughs> yeah. So like that, that is an interesting, you know, thing to point out there because, you know, obviously people have been successful with Chinese as a pretty uh, low success rate for people who like start off and say, I'm going to learn Chinese and then eventually quit before they reach fluency, which I want to talk to you about fluency in a moment, but sure. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the thing that you would have to do, I always thought was you would have to, um, cause I, luckily I did start with characters, which was just lucky because I had a, a friend who was from Japan and he, or, well, uh, he was American who had lived in Japan for six years and he had okay. learned Japanese. And he said, if you're going to learn any of these East Asian languages with characters, you got to focus on the characters. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, so yeah. I got lucky in that sense. But I always thought if you didn't do this, I guess what you would have to do is come across a new sentence and break it down. And uh, that mm -hmm. just struck me as somewhat random because, you know, well, who's to say that this sentence has the characters that are most important to say, but you could do it. You could just, you know, every sure. new sentence that has a bunch of characters you don't know. Uh, all right. It's basically top down. So you're, you're getting the yeah. message of the language first. You know, it's like, I want to be able to say, because that's a really important thing to say and or know how to say. So right. I'm going to just try to break that down. And then, I, but if you really think about it, it's like, just uh those five characters there's so much to it you know there's like so much you know sort of opinion understanding there's the different uh, different components i don't think that those uh set of characters really share that many components so it's like yeah just that alone if you were to go top down you could you could do a lot of work on just those five characters and <laughs> you know that's right there is an advantage to top down which is that it focuses on the end goal which is like look you need to be able to ask where the bathroom is so let's start mm -hmm. there and then go down and so that's why top down definitely has a place but if it goes like all sure. top down it can start to get like pretty overwhelming because every new thing you see you have to like break it down and, you know that can be that can be pretty tough uh, obviously if you're committed then you know you'll you'll deal with it but yeah that's uh that's exactly right yeah i completely agree i do remember being i i almost can remember the exact point where i was starting to realize there's too many characters for me to handle now like there's not, there's no, like once you get done with that one set or with that one book and that's it, now you're on your own. And like, now there's nothing, nothing to help me out. There's no sequence. It's just kind of 
completely finding everything out for myself. And that is what it feels like. It feels like you're being abandoned a little bit because there's no method to the, you know, to how it's coming at you. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how do you feel like you got over that hump? Because obviously, you know, you made it. So you made it to the point where you can uh, Mm -hmm. speak fluently and give, give tour guides. So uh, give guides. So like, um, how would you say you got over that sort of difficulty of uh, not knowing the characters? How'd you push through and get to the other side? I think it was, uh, I, it was like part obsession. I think, uh, I had, I get, (laughs) I was at that point where if I didn't recognize a character, if I didn't understand something, which was quite often at that time, it was, it would frustrate me. I would get frustrated and I would get mad and then I would have to go home and I would have to, you know, figure out exactly. I got to the point where I would record almost every one of my conversations. Uh, I had one boss in particular that I had a very hard time understanding. I, I forget where he was from. It was somewhere in the South and I was used to uh, Beijing dialect. So I had a very hard time understanding him. And in almost every meeting I would bring a recorder or bring my phone and record everything he said. And then I would go home and I'd listen to it again. I, I mean, I understood what he was saying, but I wanted to know every, like if I miss a little part, it would frustrate me. So I think that was a big part of it was that commitment to not letting every, anything go over my head. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a big part of it. And I think a lot of it was repetition as well. So if there, and th- I still do this to this day, this is a very common thing that happens to me. I'll see a character that I've never seen before. I'll learn it. I'll memorize it. I feel good with it. And then because I'll never see it for another year, I forget mm-hmm. about it. Right. Sure. And then I'll come across it again, like a year later and I'll go, Oh wait, I know that one. And I have a vague memory of what it is. And then I look it up again. And then it slowly goes from there. So that's kind of where I'm at, at at my current level. But in before, yeah. I, before I think this happened at a smaller degree as well. How do you memorize it? Um, flashcards. I do have a, li- I have a running list of uh, like every time I come across a new word, I'll give myself a week and I have a running, you know, notes on my phone of words that I learned this week. And any free time, anytime I'm just sitting there. Sometimes I'll do like dedicated study, but very rarely nowadays. Uh, but I will get, like go to it in my free time and try to just drill them in my head, try to use them as much as I can in my speech uh, throughout mm-hmm. that week. So that's kind of my general general method. Yeah, yeah find a way to say like, uh, you know, um, some kind of very particular word that you learned that we just find a way to like uh-huh. fix it, fit it into your uh, tour. Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? Yep. I, I, I I've done that all the time. Of, uh, <laughs> this is where they excavated the, uh, the, <laughs> the ground to build this new uh, building. <laughs> I don't know. Watch that's you. exactly right. Um, but, and that's, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's yeah, exactly would, uh, right. And that's kind of how it, but I mean, they do a lot of the, a lot of the words end up falling through the cracks and I forget about them for another, you know, another few months and then I'll come across it again. So mm. that would happen mm. when I was at an intermediate level too. Like I would see a word, I would learn it, I would forget it, I would see it again. And then I would remember it a little bit better that time. So it is a lot of just repetition. And um, that's mm-hmm. another place where being over in China obviously will help you because you have more exposure and more, your brain's constantly working on you know, oh, I know that one, or oh, I remember that one, and you're constantly getting refreshers. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. That is true, but like, you know, it's, these days when I think of my own, uh, you know, sort of activities with uh, Chinese, mm-hmm. while I do definitely interact with Chinese as soon as I walk out the door, uh, sure. in, in various ways, just by like looking around. Even there's lots of characters around, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, and you know, talking yeah. to people and stuff. I still by the majority of it has got to be stuff I'm reading uh, online, whether it's an article or it's a website I need to navigate mm-hmm. around or whatever. And so like, you know, I wouldn't, I would, would say to anybody who is not in China, but learning Chinese, you know, don't be discouraged by that because there's still like loads of Chinese on the internet to, to read and much of it that's interesting or in your area. So, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a leg up to be For in sure. China, but it's not, a necessity i don't think at all like you can definitely oh no i don't think so either i mean the sheer amount of just stuff chinese stuff there is out there is unbelievable it's Mm -hmm. i mean the amount of youtube shows youtube movies uh you know all the books you're absolutely right there's there's so much out there now 
and you know especially even the people are accessible through you know all sorts of mediums where you can meet up with the one-on-one -on -one tutor or something like that so no it's definitely not a not a necessity yeah i i just had this thing uh happen a couple of days ago where i was um on netflix and i i guess i had had my vpn set to taiwan and uh yeah i was watching um the headspace guide to meditation um which i was just curious yeah. about because I, i've used headspace before i now use a different app but i'd used it before i saw it on netflix and i was like okay let me turn this on and it just was in mandarin because i had set um, my <laughs> vpn to taiwan i didn't consciously set it yeah. to mandarin but i was like oh this is interesting and then the phenomenon happens that happens all the time which is that the voiceover artist and the subtitle maker were not like in on the game yeah. together so they yeah. <laughs> the subtitles were different than what he was saying which is like yeah. a really good challenge and it also is a reminder uh that um there, it's the you know every language this is true of every language but for some reason when we're language learners we forget this but like you can say the same thing in so many different ways and there might be subtle differences mm -hmm. and all that but you know they're watching the subtitles and then watching listening to what the guy was saying i was like the amount of times that they don't even say the same words at all is, yeah. is incredible when it's just such a simple thing it's like follow your breath and you know like these types of uh sure. basic meditation uh types of speech you know it, it, it's just surprising in that way but you know that type of thing um that would be available to mm -hmm. anyone anywhere you just turn on the mandarin subtitles and the mandarin voiceover at, on netflix which there are loads of stuff there. right so yeah it's all over the place. And I, I, I do think that it's never, you know, getting that exposure is you can do that the second you start learning. You can do it before you start learning, you know. If you're watching one of your favorite movies and, you know, you, you want to pop on the Chinese subtitles, just seeing them, just having that exposure. And, you know, that's very true. Everyone talks about that with, uh, like, really little kids, right? Like, just give them the environment, the language environment. But, you know, it is, it's, you know, same thing goes for adults. So, yeah, there's, there's tons of tons of options out there. Yeah, that's what the attitude that I always thought helped with that was. Um, do you, are you familiar with Katsumoto and uh, all Japanese all the time? That website. Um, no, I can't okay, yeah, imagine so he's what got, it is though. <laughs> he's got a great website that is uh, all about. I mean, it started. It was inspired by when he decided to learn Japanese while in university in Utah. Mm -hmm. He's a really interesting guy. Born in Kenya. Uh, moved to Idaho, wow. I believe, and then went to university in Utah. And um, while wow. he was okay. in a U Utah university, he wanted to learn Japanese while studying something else. I, I can't remember what he was studying, but he was studying something else, uh -huh. had a girlfriend, had a life. Uh, but he just decided, okay, how I'm going to learn Japanese is I'm just going to do everything that I always do, but in Japanese. And so uh, newspapers huh. were Japanese, uh, his... Uh, his TV shows were Japanese. Everything he was listening to in his headphones all day was Japanese. Wow. And, um, you know, so he took that approach and he would even, you know, eat sushi with chopsticks. And like, that's one of those things mm -hmm. you were like, well, wait, why do you need to do that? And it's like, it's not about that particular thing teaching you Japanese. It's about the mindset. It's about the recognition that if you want to, you know, try to get into the headspace of, a new language you want to consider that of course that language is going to be related to the culture and the sort of it just changes your brain it makes your brain more attuned to the to those things so by turning on the chinese subtitles on a english show that you're watching you know if you turn on the chinese subtitles and the chinese voiceover well then maybe you can't enjoy the show but like something is better than nothing so just turn on the subtitles and you're just giving yourself that little push maybe you know nothing about characters but you're just giving yourself an opportunity to be curious and uh that's a thing that um that's an attitude that i've always really uh advocated for and tried to do myself as much as i can because it's just like you know that changes the game absolutely yeah i i, I couldn't agree more i think that is and it's absolutely something now that i'm thinking about it i'm sure you know, every other advanced Chinese speaker that I've talked to has done the same thing from the beginning or at some point in their learning, you know, learning journey to where that was a big part of their lives. And you're right when you say, I mean, the language is the culture and the culture is the language. It's one and the same. You can't, you know, I, I've always been curious if there's ever been anybody that learned a language out of spite 
and if they learn a language without liking that culture, because uh -huh. I don't, I can't imagine that it's possible, honestly. You really do yeah. have to, you know, be be into it and kind of make that a part of your life. I can say that for me, like I didn't have any particular admiration for Chinese culture before. I, I didn't dislike it. Uh -huh. Like I wasn't like, you know, I was like, oh, it's right. kind of cool, like Buddha and stuff, right? You know, so and that's not sure. even technically Chinese. Um, it just was sort yeah. of picked up by China <laughs> more than any other country. Um, but sure. you know, it. it, it, it it's the kind of thing where I, but I got to know the language. And the first thing that really got me was uh, the, the logic of the language. Once I sort of started to understand yeah. the characters particularly, and then how the characters come together, I was like, whoa, this is really cool. Like, this is really consistent. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that, that struck me yeah. was the level of consistency, which is not 100%. There's no such thing as a language that is 100% right. consistent, but the level of consistency compared to English is, uh, incredible and so that was the thing that got me right away I, was mm -hmm. like, I went what would happen to a culture that has this type of consistency in their language how is that going to affect how they think and then of course mm -hmm. there's you know the language is influenced and by uh the history which is influenced by the philosophers and the historical events yeah. which is influenced by the geography of the particular part of the the world and that that you know explains a lot about china like one of the things that's interesting about china sure. is that you know, they, it's been invaded, there's been warring states periods, there's been times where it's really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where it unifies and then breaks and then unifies. But one thing that kind of the thread that kind of holds it all together is that even when they were, say, invaded by the Mongolians, those mm -hmm. Mongolians became more Chinese, they got sinicized, yeah. as it were, which is fascinating. So like when Chinese people say, we uh, have 5000 years of history, Westerners, our first instinct is to go, come on, 5,000 years of history yeah. got invaded several times. Right. Countries change leaders. Like you've had different dynasties. What are you talking about? And, but now I get, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. There are threads that have stuck with all you know, woven. passed down and woven through the society. And it, mm -hmm. a lot of it isn't necessarily to do with, um, you know, like if somebody's particularly like not inclined to like China, which kind of a bit of a common thing these days they might be like sure. well you're giving them too much credit well part of it is just geography a part of it is just you know the yellow river yeah. basin and how that is good for agriculture and then the sit i live in the sichuan basin which is not only good for agriculture mm -hmm. but also well protected it's like you know got mountains to the sure. west uh smaller mountains to the uh to the east but you know it's sort of out of the way and it's one of the reasons why Sichuan yeah. people are so chill I think because they they just have <laughs> never really had to they've never been the main target see that of any kind of yeah. issues for the most part <laughs> and so you know like so it's not necessarily like the great virtue of the Chinese people or anything but you know that's a part of it too because there's great thought technologies that have come out of this place and in Taoism and and the sort of iterations on yeah. Buddhism and all of that and how it clearly has a, an effect you know I think of like Taoist art, for example, is some of the most, just having it around makes me calmer. And I'm like, well, that, you know, the, yeah. this is fascinating that that could be true. And all of that, I didn't feel originally. And then I discovered as I got into sure. the language. And so, you know, that's, <laughs> this is a side point. That's part of the reason why whenever I see the political dialogue these days about China, I'm like, I'm not saying that anything that you're saying is wrong. I'm saying you're not getting the mm -hmm. whole picture you're not exploring sure. the whole picture of what china is it's just you're kind of looking at their sort of political behaviors which you know probably deserve some criticism uh but it's yeah sure. anyway yeah so yeah no about... that's i i, yeah, go I agree yeah no, yeah no, go so I, just, what I was gonna say is I, I wanted to talk to you about fluency because this is a, mm -hmm. a slippery word. It's a word that is very hard to define. It's, <laughs> I hate this word. it's like, what exactly <laughs> is it? Yeah. Uh, so what do you think of as fluency and what does it mean to you? Ugh. Yeah, that, this word is, it just gets tossed around so much, doesn't it? It's just, I mean, what, what, what is being fluent? Um, to me, I think at its very base level, you know, kind of just off the top of my head, the first thing I would say was just unbarred, uninterrupted conversation with a native speaker. Mm -hmm. Kind of the very base thing that I would say is, okay, I would, you know, someone calls you fluent, I would have not, nothing, nothing against it. The problem does come in though, where there's way more to that than it sounds like, because mm -hmm. um, I think depending on, 
what topic you're talking about, I think that's one thing. And then how deep you go into any topic, that's where you run into trouble, either the, the width of the topic or the depth of it. You know, mm-hmm. so we can be talking, I can be talking on my tours and telling people about the Grand Canyon and uh, speaking. And sure, I know very much about that topic. I've obviously studied it. I know how to speak about it in Chinese. So mm-hmm. I can have conversations all day about the Grand Canyon. But if you get me into, you know, a hospital room and the guy's talking to me about, you know, why my stomach hurts and I'm trying to talk about, you know, more medical theory, like, of course, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to get too deep into that conversation, like at a base level, sure. But if he starts talking about, you know, old tactics or, uh, I don't know, different ingredients, things like that, obviously, I'm not going to, that's where my language is going to stop. It can only support me that far. So I think... It, that, that's what I would say. If you can have just like unbarred kind of natural conversations with natives, um, that's where I started thinking of myself as fluent to where no matter what situation I'm in, at least for the first few sentences, I can get by and hold a nice conversation without too many ums or ahs or nega and all those, you know, little filler <laughs> yeah. words. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that that definitely uh, is is a big part of it. You know, one of the things I think about with that is, um, you know, because of course, any specialization uh, is going to require uh, a deal, a great deal of like asking questions, right? Because if you don't know, if it's not your specialty, then you're going to have to ask questions. And like in English, mm-hmm. I would feel confident that if I were going to talk to an electrical engineer or something, that I could be like, can you explain to me the basics of what your job is and what you have to think about? I don't know anything about it. And of course, they uh-huh. know so much because of their years of study. But if they're in a proper expert, then they should be able to simplify it down into the base principles and explain it to me there. Now, like, so, I mean, obviously some of it depends on your conversation partner. How good are they mm-hmm. at uh, simplifying uh, a big topic or something for a sure. novice, right? But theoretically, mm-hmm. if you're fluent enough in the language, you should at least be able to learn about the topic or learn about the subject and how to say certain things. You know, uh, I think if you can explain what something is by describing it, that will help. Cause I mean, obviously like a word, one of the cool things about a word is it's like, it's just a word, but no, it's, it's a distillation of a number of concepts into one thing. So like if you say um, for example, the thing that puts you put on the top of a, stand in a studio and you it, it when you turn it on it lights up your face <laughs> you know like they can go okay yeah, yeah. that's a, it's a light right you know so it's or it's a, a right. studio light or whatever and then you go okay now i was able to explain to you what it is and then take all that explanation and simplify it down to a couple of sounds right and so it's like if you can get there in a conversation I still would consider that fluent. It's just like, you know, you didn't, sure. you weren't as efficient as you could be. Maybe, uh, you know, you're not that you're always working on improving your efficiency, but on the other hand, when does that ever stop? I'm not, I'm not perfectly efficient with my English. I, you know, clearly. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it, no, I think that's a, that's a fantastic point. And that, that is something that, you know, I, I didn't think about until just now, actually, especially when you start to get advanced, I, I do remember that being a skill to where, like it was a maybe a, a one week span where I'm like, oh wow, I can start to talk around things that I don't know how to say. And you're you're absolutely right. That is a that is a skill that you know doesn't come for quite some time to be able to talk around things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I absolutely agree. Well, that's why I think it's good to learn categorical words before you learn specific words. Mm-hmm. So like learn shui guo before you learn xiang jiao yeah. because you can say negotiable right like and point to something right. uh or, yeah or, you know point what i mean like so yeah try to learn the categorical words first and then naturally that will fill in you'll, you'll give yourself the tools to be able to discover for yourself what certain things are i mean you know i i, I run right. into this all the time uh, and this is why reading is so helpful you know i for example i, I bought my girlfriend an espresso machine for christmas and the uh, uh-huh. manual was all in Chinese. And so like, there are obviously a lot of words in that that I don't use day to day, but um, right. it, it's like the context and the, uh, and the other stuff that I know was enough for me to like get the picture of 
what it needs, what you need to do to clean it and what you need to do to get it started and whatever. And those new words I would never have used, you know, like, and sometimes I read right. uh, what people like when you watch, for example, the headspace, uh, you know, Chinese version, the Mandarin version, I think, wow, like this is so yeah. efficient, how well this person is explaining this and how their language is so precise and on point, of course, it's pre-written, but like, it's still uh, the, yeah. the precision of it is like, it can sometimes be discouraging because you're like, well, geez, I'm not even close to that precise when I speak. Sure. But then it's <laughs> like, but the real key is just that you understand it and you can have opportunities to latch those things onto what you, what you know already. Like, you know, here's an example of something Absolutely. that it's almost embarrassing that I didn't know this because it's kind of a basic thing, but I learned, you yeah. know, so there's the, the character shu, which means number, but when you mean mm -hmm. count, it's third tone shu. And if you just want to say, just count numbers, just start counting to 10, you would say shu shu. And I didn't know that before. Uh -huh. And I was watching the uh, <laughs> meditation thing and I saw the two characters exactly the same. And in that particular case, he actually, he said the same thing as the uh, subtitle guy. And uh, I saw that and I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? So I can see the, the two characters there. They're exactly the same, but pronounced differently. And, and uh, you know, that, that type of thing will happen. And it doesn't matter that I'm not yeah. as precise or efficient as that guy. I still learned something from the understanding I got. And then, you know, at some point I'll use it, yeah. you, know, you know, whenever. So. Uh, right. That's yeah. I, I, I have that moment all the time where I see things or hear things. I'm like, Oh, that's how you say that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I've gotten through my whole career without using that <laughs> word, but I did. So yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Does, that happens very often. Oh, sure. Yeah. There's always those moments. They come, <laughs> they come up all the time where you're like, I'm pretty sure I should have known that like mm, three years ago, yeah. but you know, it's all right. Um, <laughs> but somehow you got around it and you're right. I think that does come with being, being fluent as you can, you can survive for as long as you want without, you know, mm -hmm. learning that specific word. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your job um, because it's a you know, mm -hmm. fascinating thing. And I think a lot of people who learn Chinese, might be interested in the industry because uh yeah. of course, giving uh tours to chinese people in many different places i mean they're all over the world so it's like there there's uh -huh. always a chance so tell me about um you know what your day-to-day -day, uh experience is like and you know how you find uh chinese tour groups which actually have a bit of a reputation worldwide <laughs> i'm curious Bad about rep. that yeah so, <laughs> just if people are unaware chinese tour groups have a uh, a bit of a reputation for <laughs> kind of not like breaking cultural norms because they're not really engaging with the, like they're only staying with each other. Right. So it's like, mm -hmm. they aren't kind of engaging with the society in that way. And so like, you know, there are things that they'll do for, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, spitting on the ground or being really loud yeah. or touching a piece of art that you're not supposed to touch or, you know, that type of thing. Cause sure. they're just unaware that that's the culture we've had them because we've had they're them surrounded swarm, uh, by their mm -hmm. group they don't feel like judged by anybody else they sort of only feel judged by maybe their own group i've seen this before when i've sure. been traveling around southeast asia and stuff you know i, I so I, i'm curious if you could comment on that but also just your general experience and then i'd be interested to hear about a story or any stories that you might have of like maybe a language gaffe or a cultural gaffe that you've made accidentally in this context, but that's sure. sort of a separate thing. But tell me first, just like the general experience. Yeah, uh, so we do, uh, Max Tour actually opened up as a uh, Chinese language tour company. Uh, we are, we're, we're based here in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, where, you know, tons of people come because it's very close to the Grand Canyon. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of really cool sites, like Hoover Dams around here. Antelope Canyon, Zion National Park, all these cool spots. Uh, and the only resource for Chinese speakers, if they come over here and they want to do a tour of uh, the Grand Canyon, the, we found that the only, the only method they have is to go on those, you know, big, big bus tours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our kind of thinking is that if you go to China or if you go to, you know, any country, if you go to Russia, you know, it's, it's still different being taken around by a local that knows your language versus a perhaps an American, if I'm traveling, that has lived there for a couple of years. You know, mm -hmm. even though he may be he may be fluent in the language, he may, you know, understand his stuff, but it's still it's a different feeling. You want to be able to ask about growing up in that country and things like that. Uh, and that's just something for Chinese travelers around around the world. They don't really have that 
resource like we do. You know, if we're going mm -hmm. to Ireland, we're going to have an Irish tour guide. It's not going to be an American tour guide that lives in Ireland. So uh, from the beginning, that was kind of our, why not have uh, American tour guides that are fluent in Chinese mm -hmm. and uh, kind of roll with that. So uh, that's what we started off doing. And that's what I've been doing for uh, for up to a year now. And, you know, since COVID hit, we are doing English tours. Uh, so we're kind of open up to everybody. We get people from all over the world. And even before COVID that uh, started trickling in, we started to get some great reviews. Uh, people loved our tour and we have, we have a small van. Uh, so it's about 15 people max, including the driver. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a nice small group. You get to know new people, but we started to get some Europeans, started to get some Americans. Um, and most of our Chinese speakers were either, uh, very few were actually from the mainland. Uh, uh, most were from Taiwan or uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, mm -hmm. these places. So uh, it, it ended up being a big mix and we would kind of do, uh, so as I'm driving, I'll do a little, uh, if we're coming up on a destination, I'll say it in English and then I'll say whatever, I'm, whatever I just said in English, just say it again in Chinese. Um, and especially with like, you know, we're going to stop here for 10 minutes to use the restroom or here are your lunch and dinner options. You know, it's really important for them uh, to be able to say that in Chinese and kind of make the guests feel comfortable. So that's kind of how, how it all started and kind of where we're at. We're hoping to get some uh, Chinese speaking guests back here uh, pretty soon. Nice, nice. So um, mm -hmm. tell me about uh, like, do people tend to engage you in conversation once they know you can speak Chinese and ask you questions about, uh, you know, the parks and stuff. It's actually, yeah. Yeah. It's actually really funny because, uh, we actually, we've been working on our website lately, uh, to kind of make this a little more clear, but if you were to go on and we work with, uh, some third party, uh, online travel agency. So if you book w with someone who's not our website, uh, it might not be clear that it's Americans that speak Chinese. So it is actually funny, a few times uh, we do hotel pickups and a few times I've showed up at a hotel and you could just see the disappointment in their face. You could see the fear in their face because they thought that they signed up for a Chinese tour and they're like, oh, look at this American, great. It's gonna be all in English. I'm not gonna understand anything. And you know, I go up and introduce myself in Chinese and you just, they, they just light up. Mm -hmm. just, they could not be more happy. And they're like, you know, it adds like a whole new level of excitement to not only can I speak Chinese and feel comfortable, but also, you know, this guy's American. He could, you know, tell me about growing up here, tell me about the area, obviously understands it. So it is funny that, you know, that kind of shock factor does happen quite often. That's, uh, that's fascinating to me because of course my experience with speaking Chinese is almost entirely in China. Uh, I've only really yeah. had one experience where, so like I, I, I took a trip to the Maldives once, um, uh -huh. And it was actually because I won a Chinese dating show back in 2016. All right. Which is wild. Uh, and I got a free vacation. Congratulations. It. Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> it's just one of those nice things to have on my life bucket list, you know, get a free vacation yeah, really. to a beautiful paradise. Um, and so I was down there. And of course, there was other Chinese contestants from the show that were there. And uh, it uh -huh. was the only time in my life where I spoke Chinese to somebody. And then the people around, there was a, a German and a Dutch uh, scuba diver instructors that were there. And they like, they were okay. just like, did you just speak Chinese to them? Like, they were just so surprised. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not in China. So like, this is because you know, I mean, if you speak Chinese in China, the people, somebody might be impressed. Uh, but and the Chinese people might be impressed. But like, it's not that weird. Right. It's like, well, you know, we are in a country where people right. speak this language. So uh, but yeah, I can imagine that if you know, if you were in America, you know, and if, or in your home country or whatever, and you were giving a uh, tour to Chinese people, and then you spoke Chinese, that would be a different psychology for them, I imagine, because of course, they're in yeah. the vacation mode, right? Like, there's just a different state of mind, you know, and right. so that'd be very interesting. Yeah, and I think that actually does go into, I think it makes the environment around the tour even more friendly as well, because I mean, we touched upon it a little bit earlier, but with the big bus tours, it's almost always, and you know, there, we have a couple of competing companies here in uh, Las Vegas, and it's all the big buses, and the tour guides are always Chinese from China, uh, living over here in America, and 
when locals see that, when locals see a Chinese tour guide leading a group of, you know, 50, 60 Chinese people off a bus to swarm an area, you know, at least in America, we don't love that idea. And if we see that happening, we're like, all right, let's get away from this area, wait for them to go. But it does kind of change having a smaller group. And if you see it's an American leading them, I'm obviously good at understanding American culture. So I know where to go. I know how to be polite, how to work with the local people, as well as communicate that to the Chinese speaking guests. It just creates this really nice bridge between American culture and American sites and, you know, from them coming to visit. So it, it just, it really does turn into this really nice environment. And another thing I was worried about at the beginning, because we do bilingual tours. So if there are English speaking people on the trip, then I'll do a little bit of both. And originally I would think, you know, maybe will people find that annoying that I'm speaking Chinese in the van? You know, will they kind of get fed up with it? And mm -hmm. never once did that happen. Right, Everybody yeah. in the van, because I was speaking English and then I would switch into Chinese, people thought it was more cool than anything else. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, people would start asking questions. They would be super interested. They would, some of them would try to learn a little bit of Chinese. So it did create this really nice, you know, China friendly environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think yeah. that if you had an American leading the tour, that would be good for um, the Chinese groups. Because a lot of times, if they are making some kind of cultural gaffe, it's not because they are like intentionally being jerks. It's usually just that yeah. they don't know. Uh, I, I'll always remember this thing that happened to me the first time I went, or no, the second time I went to England. Uh, I had gone to this museum with my friend and my aunt who <laughs> lives there gave me a, a phone to get in touch with her because she was going to go somewhere else while my friend and I toured around this castle. And uh, sure. I was inside the castle and I needed to get in touch with my aunt and she was calling me. And so I went to take the phone call and like this guy just like came up to me like real quick and was like, Whoa. no phone calls. No, like, you know, it was just real super fast. And I was, I was like, oh, what? sorry. And like, you yeah. know, um, the fact that there was such an instant reaction there, uh, you know, because I wasn't, I mean, I suppose it's not completely lost on me that maybe in a museum they don't want cell phones, but I was kind of like not in the main area. I thought I could get away with it. And I was just like, okay, I can't do that. And so if you had a group of Chinese people, yeah. like this place, you know, people are expected to be quiet for whatever reason, for example, you might be like, just right. give them that little warning ahead of time. And as long as you do that, and then if you give them the warning and then they proceed to still be kind of too loud, you could be like, Hey, just, you know, uh, right. You know, yeah. They're not going to be like, right. They're, they're, you know, exactly. In my experience, Chinese people, like, this is an observation I've made. And again, I'm not, I, I, when it's any kind of generalization like this, what all I'm saying is that I've observed mm -hmm. the phenomenon happening many times. I'm not saying that this is true of all uh, Chinese people or of anything course. like that. But a phenomenon I've observed, observed happening is the first, like, behavior being something that might be classified as rude, like cutting in line, for example. But as soon as uh -huh. you say like, hey, uh, you know, cut in line uh, just now, they're like, oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they're getting, getting in line. And so like they don't like hold right. on to being like if they're wrong, they'll admit they're wrong. Let's put it that way. You know, it's like, yeah. And so no, I have uh, yeah, come across that, too. And you yeah. asked you asked a little bit earlier if there was a if there was a funny story that's related to that. And I do have one that sticks. out. I think about it all the time. But it's uh, the I was watching one of the big bus tours. Uh, at the Grand Canyon and they all got off and there just so happened to be a, a big group of motorcycle guys, big motorcycle rally. And they all came up almost at the same time, a little bit like right after the uh, big bus tour got off and the motorcycles all pulled in and they all parked. And then they all went to started getting off their bikes to go see the Canyon. And sure enough, the, this group of 40 Chinese visitors, started making their way over to the motorcycles and in my head I'm thinking oh no this is gonna this is bad this is bad because I know exactly what they're gonna do they want to <laughs> sit on the motorcycles to take pictures with them and yeah. in American culture especially yeah. around like motorcycle culture you don't touch somebody else's yeah. motorcycle nope. let alone sit on it so I'm watching this train wreck happen and you know I kept thinking man if they were you know if they were a little bit close I would probably run over and you know warn them and I was watching their tour guide just staring at it. You know, he was just watching the whole thing happen. 
Right. And sure enough, they started getting up and all the motorcycle, the guys started, you know, tr- like running back, you know, getting ready to get ready to be all angry. And it was just you know, one of them started to sit on the bike and the guy you know, put his hand on his shoulder. And it was just one of those classic, you know, I don't know, in Chinese culture, it's there. And, you know, sure, they don't mind if you pose with it or kind of touch it and lean on it, take a picture. Yeah. You know, so that was one of those things that, you know, having a local person that knows things like that is yeah. pretty important. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, you're the, right. uh, it's not it's not about it's not about them not respecting. They just don't they just don't understand that that's, you know, that that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed is that so I've played a lot of weddings uh with my band in China and um, yeah. one of the things I've noticed is they don't seem to have uh much of a concern about like kids coming up to the instruments and playing them (laughs) like you know it's like yeah which i mean maybe not like a a, a, an instrument like a saxophone or something like i think they'd probably get that you shouldn't mess with that but like the drums or the keyboard or whatever like generally speaking it's kind of like letting the kids be uh they're very right which you know has its advantages right if you let the kids just sort of like uh be free to move about the wedding room uh then yeah. you know there's some advantages to that but obviously they're kids so they're just gonna be like oh drums amazing and it always it always struck right. me i was just like you know it's interesting to me that this doesn't occur to you as being like a behavior that you maybe shouldn't do but then it teaches you a little bit about your own culture in the sense that like this thing that i thought was just a universal thing isn't necessarily a universal thing like i it guess is. the way they look at it that's it's just right. like oh whatever he played he played the drum for a second did he break it well no then what's the sure. problem you know what i mean like and so yeah. it's like you that's know right. fair enough um and so i can obviously say what and i just learned i was like okay uh, i do, now when i go on a break uh between sets i just take my sticks away and put my snare yeah. drum on the bass pedal so that you can't play anything. And then, uh, you know, right. it's fine from there. And so it's just sort of, you yeah. just adapt. But yeah. And it's one of those little things. Like I'm sure if, if they came up to you and said, Hey, would you mind if he takes a picture with your drum set or something like that? You'd be like, of course. But yeah, it's the, it's the not asking that gets you. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, let's, uh, let's, Getting to some final questions here, uh, kind of just sure. general sort of uh, advice that you might give to somebody who's learning Chinese. So like, you know, mm-hmm. and there's a couple of ways we could frame this. Like one is just sort of the best sort of study tips that you've found over the years and the things that you've discovered that are, that really work for you. And then also sure. the things that we might call like your minimum viable habits, like the things that, you know, when you're in the thick of studying, uh-huh. what are the things you must do, even if you're having a crazy day, uh, you know, sure. that's uh, sort of, maybe you could talk around that and maybe a resource or something that you find to be particularly useful. Sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with that. Um, my kind of everyday thing um no matter what i'll i'll always have some podcast and music for me especially towards this later stage of my you know learning journey uh podcast and music are are huge for me um you know there, there's all sorts of different podcasts out there that you can listen to either about learning or you know all in languages or listening to there's a couple podcasts out there that just read like newspaper articles and things like that so uh, that's something I do uh, every day, kind of without it. In the morning, I'll wake up, and as I'm getting ready, I'll have that in my ear. Um, as well as music, you know, Chinese music's mixed in with all my playlists. Um, I do. I, it's hard to find, in my opinion. Of course, this is just my opinion, but it's hard to find like good Chinese music that I can that I enjoy listening to. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good songs out there, but like listening to on a regular basis, there's only a few yeah. like artists that I really enjoy listening to. So. I have them mixed in with my, you know, playlist. Sure. And then, uh, you know, movies, watch a lot of movies, TV shows, um, all of that. Um, To this day, I still, you know, watch a ton. And that kind of leads into something that I do that I think, I don't know if a lot of other people do this, actually. I've never really asked. Um, But if I, and this comes from back in university when I was learning, we would do a lot of dialogues. And that was always my favorite thing. It was my favorite activity. It was my favorite thing was, memorizing these dialogues and later they turned into skits where you could improvise a little bit as your language got a little better but in the beginning just memorizing lines and having conversations 
And I would do that with myself. I mean, obviously there are you know, maybe three characters in this little skit and I would talk to myself all the time and I would play all three of these characters and try to put some emotion behind it, kind of like act sure. a little bit. And uh, I, in a, in a way, I still do that to this day. So if I'm watching a TV show or a movie and there's a character that I connect with or a character that I like and uh, they say something that I'm like, ooh, that was a good, like, good burn. That was like a good little phrase that I could use. Uh, I will do the same thing that I did in college. I'll write it down and I'll just spend the next three, four days just saying it again and again in my head and trying to use it in, in speech if I'm at work or something like that. So uh, that's something I still do. And then, you know, maybe I'll forget it in, you know, a couple of weeks, but then the opportunity will come up. And I'll still have things that I remember from university that I'm like, oh, there's a, I, this is a perfect spot. I can use this little phrase and pop it in there. So using, yeah. uh, using media like that, TV shows and movies to memorize these little, little lines that won't show up in your dictionary or, you know, anything formal. Uh, I love doing that. And that's, that's kind of my favorite, favorite activity. Yeah, like the final emotional kind of um, like the emotional connection that you get from the, experience so like you see the dialogue and you can just look at it and you can just say this is text on a page or you can if you're seeing in a tv show you can try to like inhabit the person the character and just say okay imagine i was in this situation and i felt like they did right that can really help yeah. you. my when you when you said that idea of a sick burn um i'll always remember this, <laughs> and this is, these are the types of little success stories that you get that you know uh help you on your journey but like I, so i was with my band, we were playing at a local bar called Machu Picchu in Chengdu. Yeah. And uh, our singer was introducing the band. And uh, we all have a very playful relationship with each other. Our singer is Chinese. Uh, and she was introducing okay. the bass player, who's an Australian guy who knows some Chinese, but at the time he was still kind of learning. And she said, uh, she was basically like, um, uh, just a woman, the bass is Shaw Harrison. Uh, mm -hmm. and like the meaning like this is our bass player harrison isn't he uh handsome and i just from the back of the drums i was just like like a peer which just means like <laughs> like like handsome my rear end is <laughs> this good i mean right. like, the whole place just erupted in laughter i felt bad for harrison because he didn't know that phrase so he was just like what's what happening but that, cool. that type of thing and that was because i had seen it in uh uh Gong Yu, which is like the friends right. of, of china and so yeah that sure. type of stuff is great and th yeah and that, that's where you learn that stuff and that's kind of i feel like that's part of being fluent too is kind of knowing those little cultural or the little what do they call those i don't know little phrases that you would never learn there's no reason you would learn them in school sure. uh and there's a, there's a ton of those in chinese that make they make no sense like why would i say it like that but it's such a common phrase so yeah that's that's definitely something i i recommend music music's not easy and i'm sure you can shed a little more light on it but i find tv shows and movies that can get language skill from Music, ah, it's so poetic and so it's used so loose that it's more about the environment than anything yeah, else. Yeah, and there's so few least. syllables in Chinese, so like they have to just sort of pick one of the pinyin finals to be the rhyme, yeah. and so like they'll use right. that as the rhyme, and then because there's so many words in Chinese, they'll find a word that means this what yeah. they want, but will also rhyme. And so like that word that rhymes is like oftentimes a super archaic or weird word. Yeah. It just happens to rhyme. And so it's like, yep. it's not a word that you would want to learn necessarily. I mean, it's not that you couldn't, it's just that it would probably serve of no utility to you. And then we'll also you they're not yeah. really singing with tones like Mandarin tones because the music has to take precedent. So like, you know, yeah. it, 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 sometimes you can get- It become solid context, but yeah. Right. Which you can, yeah, which can work, but yeah, um, it's definitely a challenge with music. But then another thing that's nice about uh, Chinese media, whether it's TV or uh, movies for a learner, maybe not for somebody who's trying to like really enjoy the uh -huh. movie, but for a learner is that there's this theory I've heard filmmakers say, which is that Western media and movies and filmmaking tends to be subtle in the expression of emotion because we're so expressive in real life. So like, you know, and when we're actually talking to our friends or our family or whatever, we're very, you know, expressive. And then, yeah. uh, so we want our movies to be different and subtle, whereas it's the opposite in China. In real life, they're they're much more like, I'm gonna 
not like they Ooh, I can see that. Kind yeah. of not showing too much emotion, uh, like keeping their cards right. close to the chest, as it were. And then in the movies, sure. they're like, you know, what should I uh, like? They're just like way yep. too <laughs> expressive and over the top and melodramatic. But that's good because yeah. it means that you really get the emotional context of it. There, it's a little over the yeah, top, but for absolutely. a learner, that's good. You know, so yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it also helped, it made me think about, the, like, sarcasm and being funny is really, really hard in Chinese. Like, I, I wasn't funny in Chinese until my, you know, sixth year learning it, because, and that's where, like, movies and TV shows came into play, because I started to realize, oh, okay, they think that's funny. So, you know, mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm. if you try to translate humor, it, it's not going to work. But, if, you know, that's another thing that helped a lot. Yeah, 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 totally. It's, it's, uh, you know, humor is, that's one of the things when you can make a group of people laugh, uh, then that's, you know, and there's oh. always an element to humor, which is just saying the thing that's unexpected, um, but right. makes sense. Uh, and so like, it's that, th- I think that's pretty universal, but yeah, like something that's more specific, like sarcasm is, is trickier. It's not even that, it's not even that sarcasm doesn't exist in any way, but it's just expressed differently. And so, yeah, it can be really yeah. tough. Uh, and so, yeah. Right. But um, all right, well, so let's just end with maybe a general piece of advice uh, that you would mm-hmm. give to anybody who's learning Mandarin and, you know, um, yeah. regardless of their level, what would you say? I, I think there's, it's, it's hard. And I think being, being resilient and being consistent is just, that, that's all it is. And I feel like, and you can probably back me up on this, but I feel like there's so many plateaus to where, you're learning, you're learning, you're feeling great, you're feeling great. And then you hit this plateau where it's like, you're, you feel defeated. And it's like, I don't care, you know, it's not going to work. I know it's not going to work. I tried. I can't get past a certain level. If anybody says they did, I don't believe them. So, and then if you keep pushing past that, and you know, you really keep on working, stick with it, be resilient, be consistent with your studies, you'll get to that next kind of little peak, and then you'll plateau again. And then you got to really power through it. So that's Mm -hmm. that's what i would say don't try not to get discouraged and just be be resilient and kind of don't go easy on yourself either like yeah especially with tones i was one of those guys and i know it i I know it's happened with a lot of people where you would say ah they understand me i don't need to know tones tones, i'll put it off for later yeah Yeah. i mean i can get by without them i'll learn them later and you're just digging yourself into a deeper hole uh so things like that like don't don't let yourself off easy you know and kind of just be consistent. Yeah. Resiliency and consistency, you know, absolutely. And yeah, those plateaus happen, but you know, when you're getting that feeling of like, you know, I can't get it. Am I ever going to get this? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. That's actually an indication that you're right at the edge of something yes. brand new, right? Because that's how you feel. That's our emotional apparatuses response to the unknown. So like you're, you're right. stepping into something that is even more complicated and unknown than what you've seen before. And the first reaction to that is of course, like fear and uh, yeah. concern right. and like <laughs> wanting to go back to what you know, right? Yeah. Um, but what that means though, is that you're right at the beginning of seeing a whole new landscape. And so that's um, yeah. that feeling is, is, you know, I guess I would encourage as a method to stay resilient uh, in those moments is to recognize that you're probably just on the precipice of uh, a new sort of breakthrough at that point. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and around each one of those corners is a new, new opportunity, new whole set of, you know, things that you can understand it. It just keeps getting better. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Adam. This was a, a very yeah, informative conversation. Me. And uh, if anybody wants to check sure. out uh, a tour in uh, Las Vegas, maybe you'll find uh, Adam there over at Max Tour. And Absolutely. Uh, really appreciate you yeah. coming on and sharing your experiences, Adam. For sure. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.